none of the organizations I've worked with um, have that really in place to start with. And they're, they sort of poo poo the idea completely whenever I raise it. So I just let it go. And then we work on the other stuff. And at some point, they are now saying, oh, do you know what we need? <laughs> I'm like a product manager. Yeah. They're like, yeah, product manager. I came up with that idea. You know, like is what they, so you got to, you know, they get there once the rest of the pieces are in place. And I'm sort of like a little bit more yeah. um, relaxed about that. I'm Jason Harmon, and this is API Intersection, where you'll get insights from experienced API practitioners to learn best practices on things like API design, governance, identity auth, versioning, and more. Welcome back to API Intersection. I'm Jason Harmon, the CTO at Stoplight, as always, your host. And uh, today it's yet another old friend uh, and a virtual neighbor uh, from when I lived in Barcelona, uh, Mark Boyd. Uh, Mark, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Jason. So, uh, you know, for me, Mark was like always one of the early uh, folks that was writing about APIs uh, in just all different avenues, all different places. Uh, but kind of this whole notion of the API economy and that sort of thing. I feel like you were one of the early sort of most prolific bloggers on the subject, which seemed to keep getting upgraded. So, uh, But now you're off doing big, crazy things. So tell us a little bit about your journey with APIs and what took you to what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. So uh, before the world of APIs, I was actually working in urban planning and public health and designing um, data systems for local governments to be able to measure population health outcomes. Um, and I had when I moved from Australia to Barcelona, I had a job lined up where I was going to continue doing that, and it fell through. So I was then in uh, Barcelona, I was like, how am I going to make money? So I opened my laptop and was like, how do I write for the internet? And so I started writing for the internet, but very quickly fell onto APIs and was thinking, this is what we needed when we're designing those data models, you know, for um, local government, because if we could pull in all of this data from different areas via API, we could build the dashboards that allows the city government to know when to invest in preventative measures, when it's where they're, when they're over flooded with um fast food outlets and need to change up the environment or, you know, when that where to do the walkable streets, all of that sort of stuff, you know, and APIs would have been the solution because not only could you bring in the data, you could map it as well, do all of these really crazy, interesting stuff. So from that angle, I, I sort of instinctively knew the power of APIs and just started writing for sites like Programmable Web and the new stack to talk about APIs and was somehow able to find this balance between some of those technical aspects, the business value, and then also the, and also describe some potential use cases. So I had that sort of you know magic mix that meant that I could write really well about it sort of instantly, and I loved doing it. So I sort of grew from there, and because of that knowledge, then that led me to opportunities like. Um, uh, program chair for um, the Austin API strategy conference um, and then going on to do doing things like being invited to do some consultancy work around APIs and so on. And so that's how I sort of like built out my work that way to now doing more sort of um, API specific projects um, for a range of different um, bodies. Yeah. So your company now is called Platformable, right? Yeah. And yeah, so tell us a little one, bit about what you do with that. Sure. We're a team of nine. So one of the issues when I moved from the writing the, about APIs and then started doing consultancy work was I was getting a lot of different projects being offered to me. And so it was sort of, it was difficult to know which ones to prioritize. So I actually went to a business mentor and talked about, you know, what sort of values did I want to have from my business? And I really came across the understanding that for me, I was interested in systems that allow everyone to participate and co-create their own value. And so open ecosystems is a model of using APIs where if you've got those API components, whether that's access to data or access to web services, you can actually open it up so that everyone can 
be able to build what they want or buy what they want or, you know, customise products and services to their own needs and so on. So, you know, and it allows new market entrants in rather than established players always getting the market share and so on. So I, I, I wanted to do something that was taking APIs to that next level. And so for me, it was about how do we support the development of open ecosystems? And so there we wanted to work in um, key ones like banking and finance, where there was just the emergence of the open banking um, and API world. Um, health, because of my background in health. I did want to do sustainability. I tried to do sustainability too early and we, we're not ready to grow that fast. Um, but that will be the next one. And then governments, because of my background in government work as well. So, um, so yeah, so now we focus on um, ba banking and finance, health and open ecosystems generally. Um, yeah, and, and how and do you build those? How do you support the, their growth? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so looking into this a bit before doing our homework and uh, chatting with you before we started recording here, um, it really sounds like you kind of developed a method for uh, these sort of segments of the market and how to build their API programs. Yeah, it's really what's what I found crazy with banking. Let's talk about banking and finance as an example. So what I found really interesting with banking and finance was like, so you've got Europe and UK led on this whole idea of banks are too much of an oligopoly. So we're going to force them to have APIs and then APIs will allow new market entrants in. So you've then got all the fintech coming in to be able to build more than just, you know, banks haven't really modernized or innovated very much over the past you know 100 years you've got a savings account you know and you've got a lending product or whatever but so by having um apis it was enabling then all these fintech to be able to either provide niche services or other sort of products you know um for particular target markets you know and so that like that was the reason for it you know sort of thing and then you see there's particular regulations like indonesia says this is about financial inclusion, for example, Brazil as well. So there's all of that. But when you, so regulators have introduced all of that, but then there's no way to actually, they're not, they don't have a system to actually measure, oh, is it actually creating that level of consumer choice? Is it actually increasing financial inclusion? So we tried to take a step back and say, okay, how does value get generated and distributed in an open ecosystem. So we looked at, you know, like, so regulators come in, then you've got, you know, they're saying, okay, banks and fintech have to open APIs. And from APIs, then the level of developer experience, the level of security, the level of digital readiness will mean, you know, if you've got strong developer experience, for example, you're going to have more um, API consumers building products quickly. If you've got less developer experience, you're not going to get that um, flywheel effect, effect, you know, sort of thing. And then you need other things like API governance and standards to be playing a part and so on. And so we mapped all of that out and then saw, going back to my local government data model days, we sort of then thought, okay, what's the indicators or what would you measure so that a regulator, for example, would be able to say, yes, this is open banking is generating the things that we want. And as we did that, we realised, oh, okay, if you're a player in that market, if you're an API, if you're a fintech that wants to use bank and other fintech APIs to build your product, you could use this mapping to see where the opportunities in that market are, what gaps there are, who's being serviced and who's not being serviced and be able to sort of jump in on those opportunities as well. So, you know, all of this sort of ecosystem mapping was sort of a new endeavor that I don't see that much, that are done very much anywhere. And like it really is insight. The only sort of ecosystem mapping you see is sort of the CB insight sort of um, this is how much is being invested in um, a particular subsector of the market. Whereas this is much more about how does how do APIs uh, flow or generate this flow of value and who's missing out and where are the opportunities and where could we invest more in and so on. So sounds like you're looking. Sounds like you're looking more at sort of the the network effects and how to measure how that converts into sort of economic opportunity versus the alternative. Absolutely, yeah. And it's crazy that I haven't. We haven't sort. We, you know, we've found some models which we draw on because we sort of look for the evidence base, um, and we're always updating those. And there's some really interesting researchers out there, but there's not. But we don't see enough of it just yet. You know. 
And so I, I harp on and on. I'm sure listeners are tired of hearing me say it, but like uh, I always try to quickly disambiguate between which platform are we talking about, the Harvard or the MIT version of the world. So there's sort of like the MIT for engineer types is like you're building a componentized distributed system, right? We all get that. It's easy to understand. But then like the Harvard side of the world seem, and you see this more with the MBA crowd is like, we're building marketplaces that have uh, these sort of, you know, at least two sided uh, participant sets. Um, and that's where you tend to see more of that network effect and all that kind of stuff get calibrated a bit. Um, I, I guess, where, where do you feel like you're falling when you're looking at this sort of ecosystem development mapping? I think more on that marketplace uh, uh, side of the equation. Um, so there's that. We go a little bit further even because we sort of then think, oh, you know, my background also with the health stuff means that I'm focused on equity. So um, we're very much looking as well as who potentially misses out because the pr problem with APIs that I don't think is being taken seriously enough is they are the velocity impact of APIs is huge. So if you go off down the wrong direction, or if you go off in a particular direction that favors some players, with APIs, the speed at which you can go down that path and the um, mass market appeal that you go down that path means that you could actually seriously lock some sectors out and some uh, participants out very quickly you know so I th so there is this need to constantly keep that in mind and some of these marketplace models um, and so on don't I don't think they've got that equity lens enough in it also I don't think they then think through the indirect beneficiaries as far as society the environment and the eco local economies as well so like things like um the apis that are used for transport have an impact on like they can be used for route planning which in turn uh, reduces carbon emissions because you're able to better um uh, map carbon emissions uh, you know better um uh, better use resources to reduce your carbon footprint because you're able to get there and you're not like circling in blocks you know in a car or whatever you know and you see that a little bit with you know that whole um private jet apis as well you know it's great that we've got access to that data i think we need to discuss that a lot more as far as you know the fact that there is that like that's where the carbon footprint of the planet's coming from you know things like that but AP, so APIs do have this real value to be able to draw attention on, you know, where can society improve access and opportunity for everyone? How are they being used? FinTech's been huge at being enabling um, local economies to develop because they've been able to build employment hubs for people in areas like where you're living, you know, and so on. And so, and, and you know, this environmental footprint and some of those models don't factor that those sorts of impacts in, I don't think, enough. You know, because they're you know, uh, they're late stage capitalist models. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're. I think uh, most of us have been somewhat subject to the social experiment that is platforms like Airbnb and Uber, where it's like you know you see entire entire city compositions change as a result of these things. And to your point, like it's a digital access tier that many don't just don't have an entry point to. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So it sounds like you kind of got your got your base going in fintech, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know from like stoplight perspective and just, you know, my view as a whole, like the last few years has been quite a huge investment from banking and fintech and, and certainly open banking and all that. Um, but uh, what I find particularly interesting is this notion that you've kind of come up with some approach to governance that is generally somewhat portable, or at least by the sounds of it, between these different industries uh, to include government, finance, banking, health, and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what's, you know, what are kind of the, let's say, pillars of the kind of uh, your approach? Okay, cool. So then we did some work with European Commission where we looked at 343 to be exact um, uh, articles and reports and uh, uh, published journal pieces on APIs and the best practices and so on. And then we whittled that down, I think, to just under 200 um, where we that we were able to draw on to be able to then say, okay, this is the evidence base we've got as far as what's worked with APIs and so on, both in governments and in um, industry. And then out of that, 
Um, we, were, we developed a framework for European Commission, which is the API framework for digital governments. But I think it applies just as much to um, business or any sort of non-profit organizations and so on as well. And that's really talking about sort of pillars at the, um, at the policy, tactical and um, implementation levels. And so at the policy level, you do need, you know, I know we talk a lot about that, you know, you need the C level um, uh, it, the sponsorship and you need sort of that high level to be on board that there is, you know, let's move to an API um, approach. So you do sort of need that. I think I mean, you definitely need that. But like where then I think what falls down is when we get to that tactical level is those um, line of business managers who just have too much other priorities on. And like they're not sold on it. They may be sold on it in the sense that, yes, they know it's an organisational priority and, yes, rah, rah, we do believe in that API. They want to get their bonus too and follow the rules. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, but the, the, fact, the fact is they've also got all of these other priorities that they don't immediately see APIs could be the ones that help solve them, solve those problems as well. And when they do, they're like, oh, but it's so much work to just – Reorient. I did some work with a bank years years ago, and they were looking at. They had their leasing project. Uh, they had sort of a leasing, um, you know, line of business, and they thought that would be a good one to start with APIs. You know, so they sort of wanted to create an API, and we gave them a ton of use cases. You know, like you could help move people onto electrical vehicle fleets. You know, sort of thing for some of your um, corporate customers. You can be um, better cycling through um, cars that have only been used once or twice a year or so, all of this sort of stuff. So we, they had all of that um, and they were like, yeah, let's do it. And then, okay, first of all, you've got to have your data set then. They had a traditional data set that they were going to plug in for the API. And then they realised they had to clean up that data set to be able to feed it. And they were all like, ugh. <laughs> And so that pretty much just killed their whole program because when they saw the work that they had to do around cleaning up their data sets in order to have something of value to pass through the API, it was sort of, it's like when you get, I've heard people don't want to join a business where they're going to be dealing with legacy code where there's not good documentation. Like they will refuse a job or leave a job, you know, if they've got to disentangle someone's legacy code. And it's sort of like that. So those middle managers are constantly making that decision of like, do I invest in that now? You know, because that's going to be six months to just clean that up before we start to get any business value out of, you know, the API. And so up until recently, I think it was very easy to decide that's too long a time frame. So therefore uh, we'll do APIs on the next project, but not on this one, you know, so there was, so that there was that tactical level and then there's, you know, the implementation level, which I feel like is almost the easiest. We know pretty clearly what the API design best practices are and all of that sort of, you know, even security issues. We, we, you know, I know that there's a need for particular tools and that, but it's, uh, it's a known problem. It's a known, you know, there are known solutions for it. It's yeah, just- I mean, engineers have been building APIs for 10 years and the set, the, um, the amount of tools available for engineers now to build APIs, like I, I was like, I don't think we need tutorials for that anymore. There's so much out there. Right. I agree with you on implementation is the easy bit. So then that, so then that means, so when we then work with businesses around, um, and multinational, uh, multilateral organizations, which is a lot of our business as well, then we're trying to figure out how do you create API governance systems that aren't too bureaucratic and that don't also require you to refactor everything you've got already as well. So often it means that we've got to take a two track approach where you know, their APIs that they've got, you know, which might be like 30 to 50 external facing APIs, for example, something, you know, th- that's not unusual number. Um, they were each built individually and differently. And, you know, some use three digit, uh, three letter country codes and others used to use the two letter mm-hmm. country codes, all of that sort of stuff. We've just got to leave those because the the businesses that are integrating with them they don't have the investment to upgrade their API, you know, to reintegrate a new version of the API or something. So they've got to sort of like just accept that that's it and then sort of go, okay, but we live in a new world now and going forward, this is how we're going to build APIs, you know. 
it's so, and, and, you know, I feel like that that particular little bit there of like accept that what you have is maybe not that great, but it does the job and people are using it. Move on and build something new. I feel like that's the first hump to get over everywhere I've ever been. Uh, and the idea that you're going to go back and fix everything you did before is just like it's probably not going to happen. So <laughs> uh, I feel like that's like the thing that people just need to get get okay with fast, right? Like you're going to define a new archaeological layer in the history and, uh, you know, go for it. I, it's funny because we use terms like technical debt and someone said, I heard someone say once legacy or in other words, things that are working well, <laughs> you know, like, so we, you know, like the thing is they, that they are, they work in, you know, sort of thing. So we've got to sort of like not have that temptation of like let's rebuild everything all over again you know sort of thing now that we new know this new way you know and um and i think giving to me when we've given businesses that permission to keep what they have then that's been easier for them to be inspired about getting onto this new vision for the new stuff coming up you know, and that's where we've seen a little bit of that shift on things like data governance. So, you know, you've got API governance, you know, trying to get um, APIs so that um, they're all built to a consistent standard and that they maybe use the same data models and that, you know, they've got the same nomenclature um, and that, you know, they're using the same sort of design principles and all of that sort of stuff. But also then you've got this data governance work, which we when we've looked at businesses and organisations, they often see that as completely separate. So we've, I've worked with companies where we're doing API governance and they're like, oh, yeah, data governance, that's been done in a completely separate project. And it's like, yeah, but you've got data models in your APIs. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, 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 <laughs> we're, let's just keep what we're doing sort of thing. So we're trying to bridge those two worlds as well a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, so then you've got to work with them around the data governance side of things. And there, I mean, I love some of the stuff that's come out of government from UK around their digital services has been really inspiring and I've drawn on that quite a lot. So things like, you know, like what basically used to happen or still happens in a lot of places in government is each, everyone wants to work with schools, you know, so you've got the education department, sure, they're working with schools, but then, you know, the environment department wants to describe a new recycling program and someone says, let's Edu let's deliver it through schools, you know, or whatever, you know, then there's the nursing um, program. And it's like, let's deliver that through schools or whatever. So then all of these other departments create their own schools list, you know, and their own database for schools rather than using an education database of the schools, you know, because they want different fields and, you know, they don't need their principal's name. They need this other teacher's name or whatever, you know, sort of thing. So you've suddenly then got like 20 schools databases across various departments some of which only one of which is probably maintained well and that's one in the education and the education department's probably got multiple out of out of sync uh, databases as well so you know like the first thing and this is from that uk digital services is you find who should be the digital uh, who should be the data registrar and they're the ones who then are responsible for maintaining that. And then all of the other departments and everyone else then uses that data set via API so that it's it's not like you, oh, we need a new bulk download of that data set. It's more that it's, no, it's real time. You're just using that one, you know? So that moving, to, moving them towards that around the actual data sets, but often it's the data models as well. And just having like a set of, it might be 20, and this goes back to the, um, uh, idea of golden paths and the um uh, and that sort of um paved road sort of idea is like okay what are the 10 or 15 most common data models that most APIs use like if it's a country code are we going to do two two letter country code or three you know and so you decide on that and then you've sort of build up gradually to have those sorts of data models as well you know yeah, establishing sources of truth, right? Like it's, uh, it, I feel like that's a pervasive issue is like, you know, that nobody's really clear on who owns the data. And so everybody's got their little hoard. Uh, so yeah, just establishing sources of truth absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I don't know how much it works in business, maybe a little bit, but definitely in government, the issue is also that you don't, if you've been spending money on developing that data set, 
And now all of a sudden you're going to use a common data set. You don't want to give back that money. <laughs> so that, that's where it sort of stops at the moment. You know, it's like everyone's like, no, we want to keep our data set because you can't use that then as a way to say we don't need all of our budget. So there needs to be, again, with that legacy and, and new world order, we need to sort of accept that, okay, you can't, maybe you get, maybe there's incentives where you get to keep your budget advantage if you show you're reusing components, you know, but they're, 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 then, then you see APIs completely impacting on financial modelling for an organisation. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think you you hit the nail on the head with the phrasing there that, like, how do we build incentives for shared leverage? Uh, I, right. I do think it's very portable concept in business, um, especially if you have a history of a very siloed organization where it's like, we do this thing and we have to fight and claw for every bit of budget, you know, for giving stuff away, that kind of mentality, um, you know, it, it causes problems. I, I've been harping a lot lately that um, as companies transform their platform thinking, right? The way they think about their business, that step one is accept that your, your development, your engineering should be treated like a giant open source project. You, you can't put walls between technology. Um, and that certainly pervades into a lot of different layers, but that's all just to confirm that, yes, I think that totally is a problem in, uh, in private industry, probably a little different but nonetheless, that sort of siloed thinking and protecting from different divisions and stuff can really hamper something that, to your point, could fundamentally change the way business is done. And in order to make that transition, everyone's going to have to kind of pull together and look at things different. So for that side of things, we try to introduce the inner source concept and that sort of mindset into an organization. And as far as I'm getting at the moment, so it might its successes aren't huge on this front. Like, I don't think I've solved it just yet. But what we're doing is just, you know, simple wikis. So, for example, um, anyone who's building an API in a line of business can um, share that on a common calendar or, you know, so that there is across the organisation, you can see in one place all of the APIs that are going to be built this year. And so that if you're building an API that's got a form element to it, you might want to look at what other APIs are being built by other lines of business who are also doing having forms in there, you know, we're gonna the interface is going to be a form at the end, you know, sort of thing. And so work with some of those. So, you know, it, we're just trying, yeah, to try to get that um, mindset that you were just talking about sort of fostered by having that. Another one is a taxonomy. So showing the APIs and some of the functionalities, like what in one organization, there's multiple lines of business, but the, a lot of their APIs have checking the status of an application as part of the API, but all of them have been built differently, but they've all got that same functionality. So again, having a taxonomy of like, okay, if you're building an API um, that's going to have checking the status of an application, who else has done that? Which one do you think is the best? And again, that maybe that we move to a data model or best practices for. So eventually they've got a data model of here's how you do a status application check data model, you know, mm -hmm. sort of thing. But they might not have that at first. You might just have a look at the five that they've already got and decide which ones you like, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's what we mean by the low bureaucratic approach as well. You know, you can't come mm -hmm. in straight away and say, like, because otherwise it's like, let's have six months of meetings to design the data model for status application, you know? <laughs> I, I laugh because I've been subject to that so many times. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because I, I think I tend to have, um, you know, my sort of engineering background betrays me. And, uh, you know, I always talk about just like, even if you have some kind of management mandate, um, to your point, it's, it's really the, the kind of mid management and in larger places, that's typically your like senior VP, VP ranks that they're the ones you're really dealing with. And I don't know, man, call, call me like, uh, you know, cynical, but at this point I'm like, build a band of rebels of people who get it in, in product development, go ship something and make them look bad and they'll come around. <laughs> like, and, but, you know, it's, it's way too adversarial. This is why I'm not in consulting, right? <laughs> but, 
but I always appreciate and respect folks who work with kind of the more business side to figure out how to turn their heads away from pipeline business thinking into platform thinking because it's a different way of doing business. So I love it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. And like, like I've had, I mean, I'm a very passionate person and I get in, you know, I love the stuff I do, you know, sort of thing. So, but I've had to learn not to fight every fight as soon as it comes up. Like, and my big one is around product managers for APIs. Like I come in always when we're talking API governance and say, you know, you got to have a product manager. And they're like, no, you know, they, you know, n- none of the organizations I've worked with um, have that really in place to start with. And they're, they sort of poo poo the idea completely whenever I raise it. So I just let it go. And then we work on the other stuff. And at some point they are now saying, oh, do you know what we need? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a product manager. They're like, yeah, product manager. I came up with that idea. You know, like is what they, so you got to, you know, they get there once the rest of the pieces are in place. And I'm sort of like a little bit more yeah. um, relaxed about that. I think one of the, the biggest principles that working on big platform projects like this taught me is like walk in the room, knowing what you're willing to lose. Right? Like wow. you can't, you can't win every battle. You, you just need one thing to ship. That's really, really good. Right. Yeah. Right? If you can get to that point, the rest will turn for you. And then I guess side note too, on the API product manager thing, um, you know, we follow the, this topic pretty closely, especially on titles, uh, just cause titles have always been meaningless in platform work, but, uh, API product manager on the rise the last couple of years, for sure. Like wow. you're seeing more of it than I'm, you know, I never, almost never saw anyone with that title before, and now we see it all the time. We even have stories of AP, of product managers who design the APIs without engineering involvement uh, for the first draft. So I I think in the private sector we're really starting to turn a turn a corner. But good to hear that there's at least glimmers of hope in the public sector. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So let's see. We we touched on a couple of different things. Uh, I think around kind of business value and marketplace equity and all these sorts of things Um, as well. Some of the cultural change on, you know, inner source and some of this stuff, I guess, are there other, um, you you know, and you sort of referred to the fact that like the implementation bits easy, but I guess, are there any other sort of facets of this that you think are essential? Um, So the, so, I mean, with going back to that paved roads idea, we're trying to do the whole internal developer portal. We help build those as part of that API governance. The somewhat, I would say somewhat shitty thing about that is that um, Gartner's really seems to be really gung-ho on backstage as a um, internal developer portal. And, and, you know, it's very good at convincing everyone that they should be using backstage. And it's really horrible <laughs> to use, you know, we're, um, we're, we often build, for, we, you know, we're building these days um, internal developer portals for using backstage, you know, because that's what organizations want, you know, but it's sort of, we're sort of stuck with it, but, uh, but it's sort of like, I guess, so, I mean, there is that need for like an internal catalog or internal inventory of like, what do we have? And also when we start a project, how do I just get my project set up and ready to be able to start doing stuff rather than, you know, getting the environment right and all of those, or, you know, getting, you know, getting even just little things like, you know, um, uh, for us with one client, it's about if they're going to be working on the new API pro- project, then um, making it easy for them to be able to alert that they should be one of the user seats in the stoplight, um, you know, uh, subscription, those sorts of, you know, things that can, if you don't have it all in one place, it might take a couple of weeks to figure out that you need all of those things, you know. So we're trying to sort of bundle those together, um, which is something we've learned from team topologies and um, their approaches to um, uh, sort of, you know, making, and, you know, and a lot of the paved road stuff from like um, Netflix and um, uh, and so on around that sort of golden paths, paved roads sort of ideas. Um, so, yeah, so that will be another one, the internal developer portal, um, the, you know, working on the standards, whether that's the um, API standards or the data models. So trying to bring that together. And then what, what we see, and this is what I love about Spectral, um, is that you can then put those, those standards into Spectral so that you're taking out 
So we don't, in a lot of places, you know, the governance committees, I'm big on, you know, I think there should be a structure where you've got a governance committee or something like that. But, you know, that's just normally that's like the architectural decision task force or whatever. Um, They can approve, you know, they should be approving the API standards, if you like, but then they don't need to approve each API that gets built because if you've automated those standards, then they're influencing that decision without it without them being a bottleneck for them having to then go through and you wait for the three weeks for them to meet and all of that sort of stuff to get a pass and all of that. So, yeah, so, you know, like we're trying to look at automated systems like that, um, yeah, the inner source to be able to so that everyone's sort of more willing to share information about what they're doing uh, writing little notes about why they've made decisions, particular data model decisions and so on, when there isn't a clear data governance um, decision made, you know, uh, higher up the chain, those sorts of things. Yeah, and then and allowing that sort of legacy versus new build approach to sit side by side. You know, I think that to, together they're the sorts of approaches and working from that tactical level um, is really important. Very cool. Well, um, I, I don't know how much you're still writing or publishing things. Are there places people can go to kind of follow what you're working on? Sure. There's platformable.com. So we've got a blog there where we talk about a lot of our models. So we've got stuff around our open banking model. We've done some work with World Health Organization where we've mapped out an open health model as well that we've now worked on. I'm releasing some stuff on data, our data governance systems, um, and I've got a blog coming out shortly about our AP, API governance model as well. So a lot of that. So we do sort of that sort of thinking work um, and try to share that. We're about to re... You, so anyone can come along and see at any time our website. We're going to do a complete refresh where it's uh, moving more towards a resource hub for open ecosystems as well. Mm. So... Um, you can be checking that out um, by the time this is um, going to air, probably. Very cool. Well, uh, I, I guess I'm going to come back and, and this is always, I feel like a quiz as to whether or not you've actually listened to the podcast before, because you'll either see it coming and you have a good answer. I'm going to catch you out. And I love to catch people out. So <laughs> we talked about all this stuff. I mean, it's it's a whole lot of bases to cover to really get a platform, you know, scaled out and and governed and designing at scale and all that. But for listeners who are going, you know, we're just getting started. We want to kind of, how do we get the ball rolling? Like if you had to start from, if you go into a, a, a client from scratch, what's your go-to starting point if you don't know anything else? Sure. Um, then I think it's about finding where, who's got ownership and who's got the interest and working with them first. So there will be, and it, so it might be, so generally this has been in one of two places. It's either the, um, the, the person who's hiring us or, you know, has got the remit for being able to spend a budget and they want to be able to get the wins on the board. So them, but then quite often they're lost with then where to get, where to get it up. And, but there's some, there'll be someone in a line of business that or a team in a line of business that's building a new API or doing something that can be our pilot project so we can demonstrate how when all of this works together, it works really well. So, and we try to find that that project within an organization and then work with them because they're often quite excited. They're often quite new and they're, they are willing to admit that they don't know some certain, some stuff. And so they're eager for the extra help. And, that, and they're wanting to also leapfrog and use some of the best practices or the newest tools or whatever as well. So they're super keen. So we try to f- sort of find that team and that's where we've sort of had success in both. So we're then working in two levels. We're working with that product owner or, you know, the owner, the client owner who's sort of hired us in and then with that individual project. So we're doing the organisational stuff with them, which is a lot more slow moving and then showing how that works with that team in place as well. So you don't think that you should go design all the future potential APIs and define all the standards for a year or two before you launch them? <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with consultants, side by side with consultants who've actually suggested doing all of that. Yeah. But no, I mean, I'm all very much a work in progress 
kind of person. So, like, you know, it, when I mentioned that taxonomy, you know, we sort of just did that. It's not quite back of a napkin, but, you know, yeah. it's sort of it's really rough yeah. work, you know, sort of thing. And then, you know, we can do the – that's the MVP, you know, and then we can build from there. But that's – they didn't have that before, yeah. you know. So it's sort of that kind of – yeah. Yeah, I think you have to have a loose, big vision of where you're going and how it's all going to fit together. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I like things like business capability modeling. Some people use DDD, but, you know, we get a little religious for me. Um, but I like what you're describing as like, this we see this a lot, like the, the, you have the management mandates easy to get these days, but they don't really know what they're asking for in a lot of cases. They're yeah. like, I read that we should do APIs and we're going to be faster and make more money. So let's do that but show me how, right? Uh, and to your point is like, go find the launch partner. Where can you piggyback on the roadmap with something that already has good momentum, really make it super sexy so that when it goes out, it's a commercial success and a technical success from a developer experience standpoint. And, you know, in my view, community buildings, it's a cool game, right? Like exactly. everyone wants to be cool, especially in the engineering world. We're not cool. Uh, so we just want to emulate people doing cool stuff. So if somebody did something cool, I want to do it too, right? So launch something cool, and then everybody's going to want to copy it. And that's, that's the right. best way to sort of build the, the movement, right? So I love it. Well, Mark, uh, thanks again for taking the time to join us and uh, share all your wisdom. And uh, we'll definitely be rooting you on and, and watching your, uh, your blog and all that stuff. So thank you. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, great conversation. Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you have a question you want to ask, look in the description of whichever platform you're viewing or listening on, and there should be a link there so you can go submit a question and we'll do our best to find out the right answer for you. API Intersection podcast listeners are invited to sign up for Stoplight and save up to $650. Use the code intersection10 to get 10% off a new subscription to Stoplight Platform Starter or Pro. Take a look at this episode's description for more details.